good evening. If you're visiting with us this evening, we're glad that you're here at Clear Creek. This is the last installment this year in our Deep End series, and our theme has been Extreme Makeover, Personal Edition. And the stories have been stories about how God has taken ordinary people and used them in some extraordinary ways, and how he has a way of taking and, and tearing us down and building us back better. Tonight's uh, speaker is Patrick Mead. Uh, he's now at the Fourth Avenue Church in Franklin, Tennessee. Uh, some people here remember him when he was in Detroit. And we're, we've been trying to get him here for a few years, and circumstances just couldn't work it out. And, and we're just glad that he's here now, and we're really looking forward to hearing his message about Queen Esther. So before we begin, let's pray together. God, our Father, we're grateful for this evening. We thank you for the people who are here. And Father, our prayer is that as we study your word and we hear the words uh, from Patrick tonight, that they'll touch our hearts and that they'll allow us to know that you're the only God that's living, that you're the only God that cares for his creation. And Father, may we find courage and power and strength in the story of Esther. I ask you to be with Patrick as he shares the things that are on his mind and on his heart. And Father, we're thankful for his, not just his gift, but his willingness to use it in your service. We, we raise our hearts to you tonight, thanking you for Jesus, knowing that without him we're, we're nothing. With him we can be all things, and he's our salvation, and he's our strength. And it's in his name we pray, and amen. Well, hello, church. Well, a couple of you. All right, uh, fair enough. This is normally when the preacher says, we'll give you one more try, but I don't do that. You've had your shot. Um, those of you that have never heard me before, your run of luck is now over. Um, my name is Patrick Mead, and as you can tell by the way I talk, I'm from Franklin, Tennessee. Uh, that's the way we all sound over there. Um, no, actually, that's not true. We moved there in January from Colorado. That's, uh, no, that's not it either. Those of you, want, I'm not from anywhere, fair enough. Uh, I, I, I was raised in seven countries. I've worked in 29. Uh, my father was military, and then we were missionaries, and so it's just been a bit of this and that. I'm a Scotsman. How's that? Uh, those of you are going, oh, that would be it then. Yes, yes, a Scotsman. However, uh, a wee bit of wrinkle to that. I was actually born in this country. My parents are coming over to go to, to fight in Korea and then to go to seminary afterwards. Uh, we, we'll either send you or get you ready to go, one of the two. That's the thing. So uh, I was born while they were here and then taken back to Scotland. So I'm a citizen. You might want to tighten up that loophole, but there it is, you know. Um, <laughs> I wanted to become a citizen in a more traditional way. I, I wanted to be adopted by Angelina Jolie, but that didn't work out. And I'm not allowed to write her any more letters. Um, I, I come at the scripture from a different viewpoint. I was raised in the Taliban wing of our tribe. Uh, we were two light bulbs away from being Amish. And I left the faith when I left home. I ended up uh, getting a couple of doctorates in science, and I still teach and do research and the like, and they fly me about to do that sort of thing. But when I came back to God, I came back because of science, frankly, and that's a long story. God did a makeover on me, uh, so he did. And I've um, come back to him. I told him, all right, I was always told growing up I couldn't question. I was always told growing up this is what it is. It's a package. Take it. I'm only coming back if you're tough enough to handle anything. And I am still one of God's problem children, but I'm here to tell you, he can handle about anything you want to throw at him. And while Jacob only had to wrestle God, and I've got season, uh, wrestle him once, and I've got season tickets, I can tell you it's worth the journey. And one of the things that gives me great strength are the stories in scripture. The stories uh, of incredibly messed up people, frankly, totally unprepared and unable to do this job. Even if you take, a, I, I, I was up in um, at Lipscomb this, this last summer and I spoke for them a few times because um, they don't like to pay and, and I'll go anywhere. So I, I went there and they, um, uh, they asked me to speak about Rahab. And that's a fascinating story. 
But I mean, you have spies going into to, uh, to Jericho. The next thing you know, they're at a prostitute's house. I'd like to know how, there were some steps involved in between here. I'd like to know that decision tree that got you to this and God leaves it out. However, in the genealogy of Jesus, he puts in four women and all of them have questionable characters or something in them. That's, you know, you've got Tamar. We won't go into that story tonight. You've got Bathsheba, you've got Rahab, you've got Ruth. And you might think, well, Ruth was sweet, not according to Deuteronomy. She's a Moabite, therefore she wasn't even allowed to be near a Jew. God brings her in. God seemed to have a different opinion. These are stories, but they are our stories. But we have to start here by taking you back to ancient Persia. So it's back in ancient Persia, today it's Iran. It was completely different. Um, there, were, there were governments that had no value on human life and they killed people indiscriminately. So it's not like today at all. Um, <laughs> We need to go back to uh, Xerxes, uh, according to the, Old Test, uh, the older versions of the Bible, his name was Ahasuerus, and that's only because he didn't have any X's in that language. His name was Xerxes, and Xerxes, you need to know this about Xerxes, we know a lot about him from history, he was insane. He was a nut. He functioned at about the sixth, about a six-year-old level, if that six-year-old were, I don't know, slamming Red Bull and Jack Daniels which I'm told you shouldn't do. Uh, look at Xerxes, I guess. Uh, he, well, for example, he, he lost a naval battle once and he decided that the sea was to blame. And so he put the sea on trial. Yeah, I'm not making this up. And sentenced it to a good lashing. And he had a big chair set up for him so he could climb up on the big chair and sit there and watch while the guy went down and, and beat the sea to punish it. This was the king. This is why I'm not really all that upset at you for shooting us 200 years ago because kings are not a good idea. Have you seen the royal family? Oh my goodness. Have you seen Prince Charles? It's like his features never learned the value of cooperation. It's, um, it's, it's, like, it's like somebody kissed a frog and they didn't quite make the transfer, but I'm, I'm glad. And for those of you that, that, that well, later, because it's inevitable, people come up and say, oh, I wish I had your accent. You could have, but you shot us. <laughs> I mean, we, we were nice about it. We dressed up like targets, if I remember correctly, um, <laughs> all in red with big white X's on us. So you, you have something to aim at. That was important. And we stood shoulder to shoulder. So if you missed one, you'd get the other one. That was... Um, <laughs> And in case you didn't see really well, we beat drums a lot uh, so you could find us. And you guys dressed up like Indians and you shot us from the trees and it just wasn't fair, but I'm over it. Um, the, the Scots, being Scots, we did try a couple of things. We played bagpipes thinking, they'll hear this, think we're already wounded, not shoot us again. <laughs> and then that didn't work. So we said, Let, we put on kilts thinking they wouldn't shoot a woman, would they? Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, she would. Um, back to Xerxes. He is, the, enter into the palace of Xerxes. He is the ruler of 127 provinces from the middle of North Africa all the way to India. A vast empire, much bigger than modern day empires are. It was amazing. And he had been throwing a party for a while. Well, technically for six months. There was a party going on, and it did have a rule. You can't have a party for six months without a rule. The rule was, drink as much as you want. So as long as they stayed within that rule, everything was fine for six months. But it was time to wrap it up, so he threw a, si a seven day, the party is now ending now, party. Uh, you can't make this up. So they're still drinking, and um, at the end of all of this, Xerxes is, you will be quite surprised to hear, drunk. And he uh, wants to show off how powerful he is to all of these rulers of the 127 provinces that must kowtow to him at all times. So he wants to show them his beautiful wife named Vashti. So he sends for Vashti to be brought so everybody can see how beautiful she is. And she said, no. Now I've heard sermons on this before where Vashti was too modest or Vashti had humility and realized that this was wrong, the drunken party. We don't know any of that. 
She could have just had a bad day. But she said, no. And now, Xerxes panics. <laughs> because Xerxes is not used to being told no. This party is an example of him not being not used to hearing the word. No, they have black and white marble with crushed in gems. That's sparkling diamonds and rubies and emeralds and like, that's what they're, they're walking on. Their tapestries had literal thread of gold going through it. This is amazing. This is beyond amazing. And he doesn't know what to do. So he, not being a decisive man, he called a, a committee meeting, uh, got all of his advisors around him and says, now what do we do? Because I've got to save face with the rulers of these 127 provinces. Does not look good for the emperor over the 127 provinces not to be able to get his wife to show up. So the advisors talked among themselves and they realized that this was a very dangerous moment because if Vashti got away with this, this is in the Bible, I'm not making it up. If Vashti got away with this, women might realize that they didn't have to do what their husband said. And therefore, all civilization would collapse. Fair enough, they had a point. But anyway, um, so they, they, made up a, um, they made up a rule that said, since she won't come before us, what we'll do is make it look like it's our idea. Because way back then, guys liked to take good ideas from other people and make it look like it was their idea. Doesn't happen today, I'm certain, but that's the way it did then. See, the point I'm trying to make here is that these stories are really our stories too. Our rulers like to live like this too. And our heroes, nobody tells them no either. And it's just the same thing. Anyway, so they made a law, and the law said the Queen Vashti was never allowed to ever come before the king again, ever, period, ever. Ever. And they put an official seal on it. And they sent copies out to 127 provinces by a fast writer. And they were all congratulating each other, probably having a few drinks over it, before one of them realized, wait a minute, that means our king is officially divorced because his wife can never come before him again. And it doesn't look good for the king of 127 provinces not to have a wife. Now what do we do? Again, these are not the best thinkers that we have what are we going to do? He said, you know something, let's send scouts out to all of the different 127 provinces. I keep saying that because if you've ever read the annals of Xerxes, he never stops saying it. So he's so proud of it. Go on out. What we're going to do is we're going to find the most beautiful virgins in the entire kingdom, and then we're going to bring them back. Then here's the plan. We're going to line them up. Does this not sound like an adolescent fantasy? That's really what Xerxes was. Now we're going to line them up. And I'm going to walk down. And if I like one of them, I'll, I'll send her away. If I don't like them, I'll send them away. But here's the difference. If I like one of them, I'll send them away. But you bring them back later. That's the plan. If you ever saw, it's, it's got to be 15, 16 years old now, the Disney cartoon, The Emperor's New Groove, they stole a scene out of this because the guy goes down going, yep, nope, you're kidding. You know, and just go all the way down to pick out the one that he wants comes right from here. So we, now we enter a guy named Mordecai, sometimes pronounced Mordecai. I don't know which way to pronounce it and I don't much care because he's dead, but um, it's not like we're offending him. So Mordecai, who's, his great grandfather had been taken into captivity when the kingdom of, of Jehoiakim had fallen. Now his uncle, his dead uncle, had a daughter named Esther. The word means star. His, her name was Star. And he looked after her because she was an orphan and that's what family does. She was pretty. She was very pretty. So the scout found her and took her. Mordecai told her, go on. Go. Why, why would he let her go? Because if you don't, she's dead. You, you need to remember, life meant nothing to these people. Nothing. And so, he lets her go. But Mordecai goes too. And he just follows at a distance. And Mordecai is a very interesting character. So he is. He's, he's everywhere. So now, um, 
Esther has a chief eunuch uh, assigned to her. A chief eunuch. I'm sure that was an honor. <laughs> Not just a eunuch, mind you, but the most eunuch of the eunuchs. Now, if you don't know what a eunuch is, I really, you're going to have to go Google that one because, uh, don't turn on images, but uh, just <laughs> Google that one because I don't want to explain the medical process to you of, um, of becoming a eunuch. Um, back in those days when you conquered a new territory, you saved the best ones and you uh, emasculated them so uh, to humiliate them and make them serve you forever. Remember that's what happened to little boy Daniel. That's what happened to him, his people as well. Now they have to serve you as a sign that you're the real top guy. Well, there you are. So she has a chief eunuch assigned to her who then takes her in for a, 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 very, a, a year's beauty treatment. Uh, the beauty treatment was a supply of food because let's just say the waif look had not caught on in Persia. Uh, they liked their women to be rather substantial, um, to, uh, to leave a mark, let's say. And so you had to feed them a certain amount. And she, the, hey guy liked her, so he took her into here. She also, they had, they had uh, lotions and potions and something terrifying called various other treatments for women. I have no idea what that is and I'm okay that they left it out. It's not in the book. Whatever it was, she got the best room in the servants' quarters and Mordecai stayed outside walking back and forth. Every day he would check to, for news on how she was doing. But after six months of myrrh oil rubbed into her and six months of perfume and those various treatments for women, she was sent into the line for the king to go down. Now remember the plan. We have a plan. The plan is to walk by and send the ugly ones away, but the pretty ones send them away, but be the, they're marked to be brought back at a later date. The king forgot the plan. He, he saw her and got all giddy. And I don't blame him. I really don't. I, I, you know, I, I met my wife uh, 35 years ago. Uh, we were in, I was out in Colorado uh, passing through, and so she and we ended up in the same place, and I realized I'm moving to Colorado. <laughs> uh, I, I don't care what it takes. And, I, and I, I did some research. I knew I wanted to date her, but I didn't know how to date a girl from Colorado. So I did some research and realized that, that they like horses. So our first date, uh, we rode horses and rode them and rode them until I was completely out of quarters. And then I didn't know what to do with her the rest of the time. And there are those of you in the room that think I'm kidding, but I'm not. She needed to know what she's getting into. Um, people always say, how did, how did you know she was the one? She didn't mace me. That's how I knew. <laughs> but he liked her lots. Instead of sending her away, he just put his crown on her. And he, he, he said, oh, I love you. This is wonderful. Uh, I want to throw a party to celebrate our marriage. She hadn't gotten a word in yet. You didn't, you didn't get to choose when you were chosen in the day. So he made the day that he saw her an official holiday. He handed out gifts to everybody. He, he had a great time. And Esther continued to listen to her uncle, Mordecai, who had told her, let me know what's going on, but tell him nothing about your background. She's a Jew. At the time, that's not a problem. But Mordecai was smart enough to know it could be down the road. Tell nobody. So, he didn't know. Little story surfaces here. We have to step aside for this wee story. But please, don't forget all the other bit, because I don't have time to go back over that again. And it would just break my heart if, if I said Esther, and you said who, and we had to do this all again, right? So, we're over here now. There are these two eunuchs who didn't like the king. We're not told why. I think it probably has something to do with being eunuchs. <laughs> Just a guess. But their name were Begthan and Teresh. There's no test over this later. Don't worry about it. But they, you know, you know, they, you know, I don't like him. I don't like him either. I'm, I'm making them English because I, I can't do Mesopotamian. Uh, and, they, and, and so they say, let's kill him. Oh, that's a brilliant idea. You know, and so, and, but Mordecai overhears them. This guy's everywhere. Mordecai is everywhere. So he hears them. 
he goes and tells Esther. Esther tells an, one of the eunuchs, they're everywhere. The eunuch then goes and tells the king. The king goes, ooh, well, we, we, we don't like that then, do we? And so they go and they kill Big Thin and Teresh and hang their bodies on poles, which is the way they did things back in the day. That story's now done for a while, but it's pretty important. We're coming back to it later. Let's go back to this one now. We've, we've, do we do this story in our, we return to our story that's already in progress. Um, Xerxes had a buddy that he really liked. This guy's name was Haman, and he promoted him to chief advisor with lots of fancy clothes and stuff and made him really important. And since life was very cheap in Xerxes, Persia, anywhere that Haman went, people would fling themselves down at his feet and grovel to make sure he knew that they thought he was the greatest thing in the world, and that pleased Haman. And if it pleased Haman, then he wouldn't tell on them to Xerxes. So everywhere he walked, people flung themselves down, except for Mordecai. He wouldn't. I, the Bible doesn't say why. I've, I've had people say, because he would bow to no one but God. I don't know. Maybe he had bad knees. I, but he, the Bible doesn't say. He just wouldn't bow. And, and some very helpful people, you always find people like this, um, ran to Haman and said, did you know we have a non-flinging Jew? Uh, he, he does not fling himself at your, your feet. Happens to be Jewish as well. Might be a connection. Not really sure. Uh, and, and Haman, being a nice guy, uh, actually he wasn't. Uh, he was a psychopath and an idiot. But, um, and, and I say that as a former shrink. So I'm allowed to actually make these determinations. Um, and and, and you know, this, this guy really needed you know, the dark gun and everything. Um, this, uh, not that we're allowed to use those anymore. Um, and so I don't anymore. Uh, but this guy had that. So he thought, all right, maybe Mordecai just doesn't understand the concept. So I, I, I'm not making this up. I will walk back and forth in front of him for a while to give him a chance to fling himself down. And he did walk. But Mordecai didn't fling. Well, that just, what do you do about that? Well, Haman had an idea. So he went to the king. And he said, um, you know, instead of saying, I'd like to kill this guy, no, 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 Haman wants to go big. He goes to the king and he goes, there are people living among us. Um, you don't know who they are. Don't worry about it. You're, you're king and all. But there, there are these people living among us that don't follow your laws. And I think they need to be killed. So um, what I'd like to do is uh, get permission from you to make a law that says we can kill them all and take their stuff, and I'll, I'll pay for it. Well, Xerxes knew that Haman didn't have any money he didn't get from Xerxes, so he just said, nah, it's all right, buddy. We're buddies. You know, if you can't kill an entire racial group for your buddy, what's the point of being a friend? So um, here's, here's, here's the ring, and here's some sealing wax, and you, you just go make that law. So on a certain day, uh, they made the law, sent it out to all 127 provinces. On a certain day, uh, everybody's to form militia armies and go attack these Jews, kill them, and your pay will be you get to keep whatever they had. Wow. You want to talk about over the top? It's like seeing a fly in your house and setting off an, an atomic bomb. That's really what we are here. Well, the order comes down. People hear about the order. Mordecai puts on sackcloth and ashes and sits in the middle of the city in front of the king's gate in the road. This is not subtle. Now, he was there for some time, probably a long enough time for people to have actually used him as some sort of directional marker. You know, go up to the fasting Jew the non-flinging one, yes, him, turn left. You know, that sort of thing. Well, one of, the, one of the eunuchs noticed this and told Esther, you know your uncle's sitting out there in sackcloth and ashes in the middle of a big pile of dirt? Uh, and she, being a sweetheart, did not understand what was going on. She hadn't heard about the law. She's in the women's quarters. They don't hear stuff. So uh, she sent him nice clothes and some food. It's very sweet. Uh, he refused it, 
and said, no, that's not what I need. The eunuch went back, told her that. She goes, well, what do you need? And the eunuch turned around and went back. I'm thinking, I would have gotten that information first time. Save the trap. But uh, he goes back, goes, what's the problem? And he goes, I happen to have a, he has a, uh, has a copy of the law with him. I love this guy. He's prepared. He's everywhere and he's prepared. Hands over a copy and goes, uh, let her know that if she doesn't take action to stop this, we're all going to die. And she needs to take care of this. She needs to fix this. And the only way to fix this is to go to the king and tell him it needs to be fixed. Now that only makes sense, by the way, if you're ready to die. Because they had another law. The Bible talks about the laws of the Medes and the Persians. Medes, no relation. Completely different family. They spell theirs M-E-D-E, and they worked with Persians. Um, we are, are M-E-A-D, and we don't get along with anybody. So um, every, half the time, people put an E on the end of it. That's the English Mead family. The Scottish ones would not buy the extra vowel. So we're the shorter. Anyway, so the Medes and the Persians had this thing. If you make a law, you can't unmake it. Period. The law of the Medes and Persians cannot be changed. So what's she supposed to do? The law's been done. Plus there's another problem. That another law. That if anybody came before the king, if the king had not asked them to come before the king, they could be killed on the spot. You might think, well, he liked her. Well, today, he's a nut. You don't know. He could have an uncomfortable pillow and decide to kill her. They had guys in the, in, in the palace whose only job was to kill people if he didn't put his scepter out and said, that one gets to live. So it wasn't a negative action. It was a, he didn't have to say, kill him. If he just didn't point the scepter at them, they'd... You, you killed them. These guys are like the pepper guys in restaurants. You're know, always, always there, hovering, ready, just in case. Poor guys. This is all they do. This is their gig. They're the pepper guys. We can buy pepper now that shakes, but no, they have to think it's 1720. Anyway, um, if ever you got inside my head, you would pay money to get out. I'm just telling you. <laughs> but it's all right. I used to be a shrink, so I'm there for me. Um, I draw the little, you know, do the little dots, and they mean whatever I say. Uh, So if she walks in, and he doesn't do the scepter thing, she's dead. What's she going to do? Well, Mordecai said, I know you're afraid. Now, by the way, this is all by traveling eunuch because they're not allowed to talk to each other. And he says this in in Esther chapter 4, verses 13 and 14. Whether you do this or not, that's up to you. If you don't, God may raise up another. But who knows But that you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Now, I don't know who you are, I don't know anything about your history. Um, but that's all right. Because you're the, only, you're the world's expert on you and nobody else really gets a clue. They really don't. Let me, let me help you with this. Let's, let's do a wee bit of science and we'll get back to our story. All right? You've heard it said, for example, that no two snowflakes look alike. You've heard that, right? I lived in Detroit 10 years. Nobody's checking. You don't see white robe scientists running about going, seen it, seen it. You don't see that. But we assume, because the ones we've seen all look pretty interesting, uh, but not familiar. So we assume all of them are different. We have to guess on stuff sometimes. And the guess is that the number of atoms in the universe, again, we've never counted. There are some logistical issues with counting them, is 10 to the 62nd power. That's a lot. That's a one with 62 zeros after it. However, we can take the DNA from one male and one female in here and make 10 to the 128th power different individuals, no copies, no twins. 
Now, if you're thinking 10 to the 62nd, 10 to the 128, that's like twice. No, you haven't done a lot of math, have you? It's, it's, it's quadrillions of times more the way exponents work. The point I'm trying to make is this. You are far more unique than the universe in which you live. Atoms, I don't care what the atom is. We got lots of them. And we're always going to have lots of them. You, this is it. This is your only time to spend around the sun. In Psalm 139, the Bible says, before you were born, God saw you, he formed you, he wove you together, he wrote a book about you, and he turned you loose. It doesn't mean that you don't have choice and free will, it just means God has some ideas for things you can do. And he did for Esther too. But what if you decide not to do them? Like Mordecai said, he'll get somebody else. But you've lost, you've lost out. Because you're unique, you're who you are. You're like your children. You've noticed this about your kids, haven't you? You don't get kids that are all the same. We have a daughter and a son, both grown now, children of their own. Our daughter, if you dropped her from a helicopter over a deserted island, she would have 33 friends before she hit the, the sand, and they'd be organized. <laughs> if you dropped my son from the same helicopter, he would, before he landed, already figure out shooting lanes and sniper nest. He's a Marine <laughs> and good at it. He doesn't want people to come to his island. He's a loner. He does things his own way. My daughter, so community. They came from us. We, my wife and I look at each other and go, I, I have no idea. Our, after 300 years of us being uh, Royal Marines, British Royal Marines and Scottish Blackwatch units, our son is our first United States Marine, which we're very excited about finally somebody on the winning side. Uh, and, and he's excited that he doesn't have to fight in a skirt. You know, that's nice. Um, you know, you're climbing up in a tree, don't look, you know, that sort of thing. It's, it's, it's quite embarrassing. We don't actually fight in those. I hope you know that. We used to. We used to. But we don't do that anymore. Anyway, um, that, that said, my son is six foot five. And, I'm, and I know what you're thinking. Because everybody asks, where did he get his height? Um, from me. I wasn't using mine. I'm a height donor. The point I'm making is he's not me. My daughter is not me. They're not my wife. God makes individuals. We moved to Tennessee from Colorado where we lived on the slopes of, of uh, Pikes Peak. We lived at 6,700 feet, and several times we would go up to the top of Pikes Peak, which is 14,114 feet. It's, it's fun. People from this part of the country turn blue and fall over at about 9,000 feet, but the rest of us would go up there. I'm still getting used to all the oxygen down here. It makes you giddy. Um, <laughs> but we'd go up to the top of the mountain, and especially in the evening and then the night when the stars just come out, because you're so far away from all light pollution. And I always wait because some idiot's going to say it. And I say idiot in all Christian love. <laughs> um, everybody takes turn being an idiot. You know that, right? Uh, so, but we're looking up. And somebody will go, ah, I'm going to make him English again. Look at the stars. So vast. So many of them. So far away. Doesn't it make you feel small? No. Uh, it's a burning rock. I'm over it. But me, I'm fantastic. And that's usually when they leave. But the point I'm trying to make <laughs> is that we were created for a purpose. What if you think you've soiled your purpose? You've, you've, you've blown your purpose. You had your purpose, but you married the wrong person, or you, you drank too much, or you, you blew it on education, or like, like God can't use people that don't have much? Have you read these stories? Have you read the Moses story? It's hilarious. I don't know why we, we do VBSs on this and don't have to hold our sides. He's 80. And God comes to him and says, got an idea. I want you to go, take a long journey. Yes, you have to walk. Um, I want you to go back to the country where you're wanted for murder. Go up to the head guy and say, right, you, I'm taking all of your labor force with me. 
And Moses doesn't think that's a good idea. <laughs> I'm with him. Oh, nice. Yeah. Really? What? Seriously? And, and he makes a lot of excuses. And then finally God goes, no, no, it's all right. Here you go. Here's a stick. <laughs> People, the Bible is hilarious. Oh, there are some serious bits too, you know, but it's hilarious. An 80-year-old guy with a stick. And you're going to see God going, sick him. Go for it. Be great. But what happened? Don't worry. We're going to rain frogs. It's going to be fun. What, you, we're going to what? And, the, and even later, whenever they have to walk through the water, I know I've seen the movie. It's very impressive. And everybody goes, yes, the power of God. They'd never seen the movie. You know. And he goes, walk through there. We're going, ah, no, no, no. Uh, this is a trick. Because that's not natural. God uses people like us who are completely unqualified and broken. So, for example, I have no Bible degrees and I never took a speaking course, can you tell? I, I, I'm, I'm much more comfortable with test tubes than I am with people. And yet, God keeps saying, no, let's do this with them. You show up, God does stuff. That's all I can say. So he's saying, Esther, show up. So she does. She walks in the palace. You can almost see the pepper guys, not really, the the sword guys. Yeah. But Xerxes is still smitten, and he goes, oh, and points the scepter. And he goes, what do you want, sweetie? I'll give you even half my kingdom. He kept trying to give her half the kingdom. I went back through and did the math once, and he would have ended up with like 164th of the kingdom had she always said yes. (coughs) So she goes, no, no, that's, I don't need all that stuff, you know, and, uh, and you, know, you don't need to get me anything for my birthday. You know, those lies women say. And uh, she said, all I'd like you to do is come, come to have dinner with me. Really? Can I bring a friend? Yeah, sure, bring a friend. Haman's over there going, eh. So they go to dinner. And um, they're having a great time. And, and Xerxes is just over the moon here. And who wouldn't be over the moon? His wife is flirting with him. Men love this. Men love to be manipulated. Ladies, please write this down. We love being manipulated. I know you hate it. Wim- guys, women hate being manipulated. Ladies, men love being manipulated. We do. If you say, honey, could you get this lid off? We're getting that lid off. (laughs) And I don't care if it takes us back and over it in a Jeep. We're going to do it. And then we're going to tell you it was easy. (laughs) Come on, if we wash a dish, we'll show it to you. Look at that. Wash that for you. You can look at him saying, but you ate it off of it. And no, hey, no need to thank me. I'll set it right here so that you can put it right there later. But I won't put it right there because I'm a guy. I always tell my wife that's because we have Y chromosomes. That extra bet that knows all that stuff broke away. <laughs> anyway. So he is, uh, by the way, if you, if you have a hard time remembering that manipulated thing, just think of it this way. The, uh, we have stores called Victoria's Secrets. We don't have stores called Bubba's House of Briefs. Right, this only works one way. And so, Zark, you can, you can quote me, but say Joey said it. <laughs> so, Xerxes is coming on, he's just floating, he's, yes. And, and, and he said, honey, I'll give you anything. I'll give you half my kingdom. He tries that as well. And she goes, no, no, would you come back and have dinner with me tomorrow? See, she's too afraid to tell him tonight. He's got to work up her courage. So he's just happy, 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 happy. He goes home, and he can't sleep. I don't know why. Bible didn't say. Could be Esther wasn't that good at cooking. Could have been he was overcome by the smell of myrrh. I don't really know what it was. But he decided, they didn't have pills back then to sleep, so they slept by having people read them official government documents. (laughs) That would do it. It really would. So he said, read me some official. And they said, well, here's a story about these two guys that wanted to kill you named Big Thun and Teresh. Told you we were coming back. I bet you thought I forgot. And he goes, well, that's a great story. What did we ever do for that guy that told us all about this? And they said, 
We didn't do anything. There's nothing in the records. And he says, well, that, that's just, well, we gotta do something. That was Mordecai, if you remember. So the next day, he's in the palace. Here comes in Haman. He's had a great night because he got to go in with the king and the, and the king's sweetie muffin and everything's wonderful. And uh, the, he's about to, he's, he, but he's upset. He's upset because on the way home last night, Haman had a problem. He went by Mordecai, the guy sitting in the ashes, and he didn't fling. And, and Haman has just had it. So last night, he talked to his wife, and he said, you know, I'm really important and everything, and I got to go with King and with his sweetie, and I'm really, impor- I'm, I'm, I'm an important person. And this, this non-flinging Jew just refuses to fling, and she said, oh, sweetie, that'll be all right. We'll take care. Why don't you just ask for a huge tall pole and, and, and that you can stick his body on? And he's going, you know, I knew I loved you. You're such, what a wonderful woman you are. So that's where he's come in now. And his plan is to ask, that, can, I just, can we just have him killed and put his body up on a big tall pole? And so he's about to say that. And, he goes, ah, and the king goes, I have a question for you, Haman. Well, what would that be? What if there was this guy that the king really liked? Now, Haman thinks, <laughs> okay. And, and, and king really wanted to show him he was special. Really, really special. What should he do? Haman was not a quick thinker. He, he literally said, well, you'd let him wear some of your clothes. Oh, You'd let him, and, and ride on your horse, and you'd have somebody lead him around the city saying, this is a guy the king likes. Really? That's what you came up with? But Xerxes, not being a good thinker either, goes, brilliant. <laughs> Do that for Mordecai. You get to lead the horse. <laughs> All day long, Haman's riding rather walking. This is a guy the king likes. Really likes this guy right here. All around the city. That night he gets home. Barely has time to get dressed before the eunuchs come by to take him. Eunuchs are everywhere. To come get him uh, if you ever need one. Um, but to, to take him, you, know, you can almost hear the wife, honey, your eunuch's here. And so, uh, to, and so now he's got to go to dinner and he's trying to get his head around, right? Okay, well, I'm going back to dinner with the king and the sweetie. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. It's just a bad day. Just a bad day. That's all it is. So they come in, they sit, and they have another dinner and the king is besotted again. And he goes, is there anything? What do you even, you know what he's going to say, up to half of my kingdom, I would give it to you. And she goes, no, but there is one thing you could do. Well, what's that? Please don't kill me. What? Who, who, who would dare kill you? Who's a, and she goes, oh, he would. <laughs> you go see Haman going. He didn't know she's a Jew either. He does now. <laughs> would have been nice information to have earlier. The king doesn't turn around and punch him out. King's not that quick a thinker. Stomps around, and he walks out. He's got to think for a while. Haman starts begging. (laughs) Oh, please, 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 please. And to show he's very serious, he even flung himself. That's the word used. Flung himself at her feet. But he hadn't had a lot of practice flinging. So he landed on her. Right when Xerxes walked back in the room. Oh, that's bad timing. That was, that doesn't look good at all. Xerxes is still stomping. What? You, you, what? And and Harbona, another eunuch, happened to be in the room. He liked Esther. And Xerxes is going, what? I'm going to do something, but I don't know what I'm going to do. And Harbona just said, oh, look, would you look out there? There's this really big, tall pole, but there's no body on it yet. <laughs> <laughs> Haman was killed and hung on the pole. 
They had to make a new law, couldn't rescind the other one, but they, they told, they made a law that the Jews could buy weapons to protect themselves on that day. And they survived. One of the uh, great mysteries of history is why we have Jews. Not back then, now. I mean, where are the Edomites? Where are the Philistines? Where are the Phoenicians? Any of the sea peoples we call them today. Where, where are the Jebusites, the, Sar- uh, the, the Perizzites, the, the Gadites? Where, where are these people? They're not here. Where, where did they go? They all died. They were all absorbed. They all still Jews. Well, then God must have sent incredible heroes. Well, you know, some people did some heroic things, but they were just people. People like Abraham, who's so afraid he sold out his own wife twice, didn't really know what to do. You have David. Eh, there's you know, murder, treason, adultery, but let's not quibble. God has always used broken, inadequate people. Notice God never had a Goliath. He never had a, you can't kill me and you can't touch me. Never had one. Always use, in fact, even talking about his son, a man of sorrows, well acquainted with our grief, we hid as it were our face from him. He's not even going to be good looking and he's going to have down days. Hmm. When God wants to make over the world, he doesn't use heroes, he uses us. The broken, the disappointed the dirty, the flawed, the sinful. That's who he uses. He uses people like us. When he wants to change the world, he'll get an 80-year-old guy with a stick. He'll get a widow that only has two mites to her name. He'll get a fisherman who doesn't know when to shut up. He'll get Paul who doesn't know when to use a period in a sentence. I mean, I love him and all, but please, a semicolon would have helped. (laughs) He uses people like Esther. But are you ready for this one? We have the official documents. They're in the British Museum, because that's what Britain did. Just went around, conquered everything, then took it home. We have Xerxes' records. Esther's not mentioned. But don't get excited. I think Esther, I think it's a true story. Then why wasn't she mentioned? In fact, Vashti disappears for a while, but then Vashti comes back, even though the law says she couldn't, and the heirs to Xerxes are her children, not Esther. Why? Could be that after all of this, he couldn't see, stand the sight of her again. It could be she died, people died of all kinds of diseases back then. But the point is, she showed up, she did what she could while she could, and history forgot her, but God did not. You and I may not be all that important to our neighbors, but God has plans. And all you gotta do is show up and say, where would you like to go today, God? And he will take whatever you had and make it something new even an extreme makeover, like he's done with me. By the way, we're still remodeling. He's told me a few more walls have to go. But I'm all right, I trust him. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, bless this church. Bless every man and woman in this room. Fill them with your spirit. Give them peace about their mistakes and their flaws and their sins. Let them realize that you already knew that about them a long time ago, but you still loved them. Father, thank you for not condemning us, but thank you that love covers a multitude of sins. We pray that we will live our lives so that you don't have to call another to do what you wanted us to do. Help us to step up, face forward, and walk. In the name of Jesus, the whole church says, amen. Thank you, Patrick. That was, uh, that was interesting. <laughs>
You know, it's, uh, as I was sitting there listening to you tell the story and then tell your story, and I kept thinking, he's channeling his inner Robin Williams here. I, just, I could just feel that happening. This was wonderful. Thank you.